right, we'd like to start the meeting, please. If we could all stand for the uh, Pledge of Allegiance. I'm going to start by saying we were at your uh, Gaggy Elementary today for their ribbon cutting and they did the Pledge of Allegiance and I thought I would love to have all those kids at every one of our board meetings. Is that not cool? Absolutely. It's very cool. All right, welcome everyone. Let's see here. All right, I need a motion to approve the agenda. Moved. I have a motion and a second. Any discussion? All right, all those in favor say aye. Second. Anyone opposed? All right, that passes. Need a motion to approve the Board of Education meeting minutes for January 17th, 2019. Moved. I have a motion and a second. Any discussion? All right, all those in favor say aye. Second. Anyone opposed? And we have one abstention. Need a motion to approve the Board of Education meeting minutes for January 27th, 2019. Moved. I have a motion and a second. Any discussion? All right, all those in favor say aye. Aye. Anyone opposed? Right, that passes. A motion to approve the Board of Education Special Workshop meeting minutes for February 1st, 2019. Second. Motion and a second. Any discussion? All right. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Anyone opposed? All right. That passes. And we need a motion to approve the Board of Education meeting minutes for February 1st, 2019. Moved. Motion and a second. Any discussion? All right. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Anyone opposed? All right, that passes. So we have a few patron comments tonight. The first one is a gentleman by the name of Bill Brown. And I'd like to wel welcome Bill, one of our f uh, former board member, past president of the school board. And I'm going to read this. Citizens wishing to make statements to the Board of Education, I shall sign one of these cards, which he did. Any citizen uh, can certainly come in front of the board and speak, and I'm on the wrong side. So let me start over. Where was I? A little got you all nervous. Bill, sorry. Oh, you have three <laughs> minutes, Bill. Do you know that? All right. I think anybody's made her that nervous before, Bill. <laughs> all right, Bill, go ahead. You're good. Uh, President Mondel, uh, Dr. Knost, and board. Uh, I just saw Dr. Kinder roll his eyes because he's, deter he's certain that I won't be able to stay within three minutes. I promise I will keep my remarks within the allotted time. I'm here for two reasons. <coughs> to thank two people that I personally know are partially responsible for the state of Rockwood. No one person is responsible for our current state, and it's very strong, and I'm proud of it. And I've made Matt roll his eyes many times because I remind everyone, I started at Baldwin Elementary in 1957, and I stayed active in Rockwood well past any time that anyone wanted me to. <laughs> <laughs> but these two people that I'm going to thank this evening, I think are leaving us soon, and I think they deserve to know how I feel. Dr. Knost, I want to personally thank you for helping to restore Rockwood to its current and deserved respected position. I wish you all the best in what you do in the future. And I know when you came aboard, uh, you may have had reservations, but you've done a lot to make sure those reservations have gone away and that this district is something I'm once again very, very proud of. Secondly, Matt Dole, thank you. We didn't always agree, but I always respected your views, and I never once doubted your loyalty to Rockwood. Even though you are a Parkview West graduate, I have a grudging respect for your viewpoints. <coughs> what all of you do is not easy, believe me, I know. I hope this humble thanks in some small way repays you for the hours, the time, and the other stuff that you get by being on the board. That's all I had to say this evening. 
Dr. Kinder, I kept it well under three minutes. <laughs> Thank you, Bill. Is that it, Kathy? <laughs> All right, we have a representative here from Ameren, Missouri, and uh, you're going to come up and, and talk to us about something really very cool, right? All right, welcome. Good talk, you okay? <laughs> Well, I'm sorry, but Paige Selby, my coworker, couldn't make it tonight. Um, I just want to thank the Rockwood School District um, for participating in our Biz Savers program. $171,000 check is very impressive, and I can't thank you guys enough for that. I've been with Ameren for about eight months now, and I've done many school presentations for the Rockwood School District, and I can't thank you guys enough for your, your well-mannered students, and every time I've done a presentation for them, they have been very kind and thankful and I just I just want to say that and thank you guys once again thank, thank you, you very, very much. much what is your name sir Lincoln Lincoln Stoll Lincoln Stoll Stoll thank you Lincoln thank you good all right next up we have um, superintendent and board comments Dr. Knoss well Bill I had no idea that's why you were here um, and I'm not ready to start getting emotional because I've got a number of months to go here. So, But I will say, just to throw a compliment back to Bill Brown, those who don't know, um, in essence, Bill hired me. Bill was the president of the board, and uh, he's the one on a Thursday night I got a call from uh, after going through the, the process. And uh, your, your uh, grace at handling hiring a superintendent and welcoming me um, meant the world to me and and as those who are around know I wasn't looking to leave where I was um, but once I met the board and through through Bill's leadership it made it pretty easy uh, to make the decision so likewise right back at you Bill I mean anything that I've done starts with your leadership at the time uh, and your willingness and efforts to to bring me here so thank you for that and thank you so much for coming up and I echo your thoughts about Matt too I try to talk Matt into staying on the board even though I was leaving and it didn't work but uh, <laughs> but he'll be missed for sure all right let's see let's talk about um, let's talk about our, our anti-bullying ambassadors that we have in place this year. You may recall um, I got the idea of the concept of uh, anti-bullying ambassador from a video that I was watching and that, that word was just used, not a structure or anything. And I went to uh, Terry Harris who is never a guy that's uh, interested in saying no or turning down work, especially when it's a good cause for kids. And Terry ran with it. So we have a structure up and running in our middle schools and now it's bleeding into our elementary schools. Our Wildwood middle eighth grade students visited Green Pines as anti-bullying ambassadors uh, on January 29th. They teamed up with third, fourth, fifth grade students to raise awareness and encourage them to speak up against bullying. And students talked about why people bully and how they can use uh, RSD, Rockwood School District, but instead standing for recognize it, stop it, and describe it to help decrease bullying in the schools. And you can learn all about the RSD Anti-Bullying Ambassadors, Ambassadors Program on our district website. It's a really a neat thing. It's really powerful when kids become ambassadors to, uh, to stop bullying. And these middle school kids, they're, um, they're, they're really taking this seriously. And now to see their impact going to the elementary schools is a, is a really great thing. Uh, a couple of congratulatory remarks for um, Lafayette High School and for Blevins Elementary School. Both have been selected as Missouri Schools of Character, which uh, join the ranks of, um, of uh, all of our other schools in, in the district. And Lafayette being, uh, you know, it, there's not many high schools that, that, that apply for and go after being a school of character, but Lafayette did. And we also had a, a honorable mention for Eureka High School. So that what that means, if they apply next year and things are still going well, they'll probably be a school of character. But uh, Dr. Sharon Jackson and uh, Dr. Karen Calcaterra, 
course, very worked hard, worked very hard, and still the values that uh, represent a school of character. The criteria for the selection are based on Character.org's 11 principles of effective character education, which include providing students with opportunities for moral action, fostering shared leadership, and engaging families and communities as partners in the character building effort. So congratulations to those schools. Let's see, we had the uh, annual Mu uh, Missouri Music Educators Association, their 81st annual conference just uh, recently in January. And we were well represented, as we always are. 26 students from all four Rockwood High Schools participated in the all-state ensembles. Not an easy band to get into. I know that from personal experience. It's uh, quite an honor to even have one or two kids involved. And our district has... Uh, has 26, um, and that includes all-state band, all-state jazz band, all-state orchestra, and all-state choir. And students have to go through a pretty rigorous and highly selective audition process to be named as members of one of these prestigious ensembles. So congratulations to all of our kids. And students from all four of our high schools also competed at, uh, at the Missouri State Thespians Conference in Kansas City last month on a nice snowy weekend where we had to keep them there an extra night because uh, it was a safe thing to do. But at the conference, the students uh, had the opportunity to compete, participate in workshops and audition for colleges. And Lafayette's improv troupe called Undefined received a superior rating for their performance. Several Rockwood Summit students received superior ratings and many Rockwood students received callbacks following college auditions and invitations to collegiate programs. Congrats to all those students. Also along the lines of character education, Green Pines uh, has been awarded a lighthouse status school. Uh, Dr. Godwin says uh, it's been a six year journey for them. It makes students feel valued by giving them leadership opportunities. It's all part of Stephen Covey's Leader in Me program and his book. And they are fully embedded in that um, that that book and the understanding, the teaching, and the practicing uh, at Green Pines. Students, staff, and parents work together to demonstrate schools uh, to meet the lighthouse qualifications. So congrats to Green Pines. And finally tonight, Rockwood residents benefit every single day from the dedicated energy and countless hours devoted by one group of people in particular. And these public servants seated around me are elected by Rockwood District residents, and um, contrary to popular belief, uh, they didn't get paid when Bill was on the board, and they still don't get paid. Uh, and February 10th through the 16th is Missouri School Board Recognition Week, so I uh, ask you to join me in saluting our Rockwood School Board members. We've got a little video for you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Rockwood Board of Education. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, everybody. Eric Knost here, your superintendent. It is Board of Education Recognition Week. In the Rockwood School District, we are a family from every school to central office and beyond. And we cannot thank our board of education enough. They're all wonderful volunteers that serve our district and we just need to say thank you for all you do. So, happy Board Recognition Week. Thank you, Rockwood Board of Education. Thank you! So thank you all. That was payment enough. Yeah, that was, that was payment, yeah. <laughs> there's, your, there's your pay. Yep, uh, that was it. <laughs> that's all I have. Thank you. Any board comments? Well, I think we should stop and take a moment and congratulate our Rose Award nominations went out this week. And uh, we have a few of those in the building, I think, tonight, right? Right? So congratulations to everyone who was nominated. That's it? All right. <laughs> Go ahead. Anyone else besides what I said about Gaggy this afternoon? It was a great ceremony. It was rescheduled from, that was a snow day we had, right? Um, back in January, was it? Really, really well done. Had it inside. It was, uh, it was a lot of fun. Lots of ribbons to cut, so it was well done. Anyone else on board comments? 
All right, so we need a motion to approve the consent agenda items as submitted. Moved. All right, we have a motion and a second. Any discussion? Dr. Kinder. Yes, we have, we have several donations tonight. There's five major donations. First one, Gaggy PTO monetary $10,000 donated to the PE department. Money is being donated to Gaggy Elementary from the PTO to purchase four basketball hoops outside after the new construction area for PE. The second one, Michael R. Mangan, monetary, $1,200 donation to support service learning. Donation was given to the school to help students, to help support the service learning trip we take during spring break. We'll skip one. Angels in the outfield, monetary, $3,000. Donation made payable to the boys basketball and baseball teams to be used at the discretion of the team. Donations made payable to the boys basketball team and baseball team to be used at the discretion of the team. Donations to be split equally between the two teams. Lowe's Home Improvement Monetary, $3,170. Security sleeves for classroom doors. PTO applied for a grant to benefit Westridge Elementary. The monetary gift will be used to cover security sleeves for classroom doors. Let's go back to the, the third one. This is from James and Susan L. Jacobs, monetary $2,314.61. Scholarship to honor Sergeant Zachary Fisher. Parents of Sergeant Zachary Fisher are setting up a scholarship in his honor. This is the initial year of the scholarship and funding will be contributed yearly from the Fishers to fund the scholarship. As a veteran, I have a special place in my heart for all veterans. <laughs> and from, from the memorial page for Zachary, in 2010, it reads, Sergeant Zachary M. Fisher 24 of Baldwin, 618th Engineer Support Company, Airborne, 27th Engineer Battalion, Combat Airborne, 20th Engineer Brigade, Combat Fort Bragg, North Carolina, was killed July 14, 2010, in Zabu Province, Afghanistan. Zachary was a 2004 graduate of Marquette High School in Chesterfield, earning the President's Achievement Award as a senior year in high school. Sergeant Fisher's awards include the Bronze Star, Purple Heart, Army Commendation Medal, Army Good Conduct Medal, National Defense Service Medal, Afghanistan Campaign Medal, medal with Campaign Star, the Iraq Campaign Medal with Campaign Star, Global War Terrorism Service Medal, Non-Commissioned Officer Professional Development Ribbon, the Army Service Ribbon, the Overseas Ribbon, the National Medal, Combat Action Badge, Parachutist Badge, and the Driver Qualification Badge. The Honor Guard for his casket were eight of his Army brethren from Fort Bragg. The procession covered over 100, 100 riders from the Patriot Guard. Thank you. Dr. Kinder. Oops. Motion to approve the consent agenda, agenda items as submitted. All those in favor say aye. 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 Anyone opposed? That passes. All right, next we have uh, our agenda items. So we're going to start with the superintendent search process. And uh, this evening, our board is eager to share an important update regarding our superintendent search. As you know, during the last few months, we've conducted an extensive search. Through our recruitment process, we acquired a pool of top candidates for consideration. The search firm, represented by Dr. Brent Underwood, who was fantastic and led us through this process um, very well, presented us with 24 candidates from 10 states, the vast majority of whom had experience as a leading superintendent. From that pool, we selected those who were awarded personal interviews based on, upon their qualifications. 
The final two candidates came back and met with a committee comprised of a cross-section of school and community representatives. As a school board, we valued this input and took it to heart as we selected the top finalists to be the next Rockwood Superintendent of Schools. We certainly appreciated the involvement of our Rockwood community throughout the process. Through all of your participation, surveys, focus groups, and open community meetings, we were just very fortunate. Everybody was so, uh, such, I mean, overwhelmed sometimes. We appreciated it. So at this time, I'd like to make a motion to enter into a three-year employment contract with Dr. Mark T. Miles to serve as superintendent of the Rockwood School District effective July 1, 2019 at an annual salary of $225,000 plus benefits for the 2019-20 school year plus annual increases as documented in the contract. Move. We have a motion and a second. We have a roll call vote, please. Mr. Dole. Yes. Dr. Kinder. Yes, ma'am. Mr. Miller. Yes, ma'am. Ms. Romberg. Yes. Mrs. Bays. Yes. Mrs. McGett. Yes. Mrs. Mondel. Yes. Motion carries. Rockwood, you have a new superintendent of schools, effective July 1st, mm -hmm. and his name is Dr. Mark Miles. So before you all start Googling him, <laughs> uh, we're going to tell you a little, a little bit about him. And first of all, I have talked to him several times on the phone in the fa past few days. He is thrilled beyond words to be coming to Rockwood. So let me tell you a little bit about his education and uh, kind of what he believes in. His education is very impressive along with his history of work in top rated school districts. His student-centered vision aligns with our school community. We heard that time and time again. That's the most important thing. That's why we're here. He shares our continued focus upon learning, leadership, innovation, and service to our kids. He has a strong professional background. He is currently the superintendent of the Indian Hill Exempted Village School District in Cincinnati, Ohio. During his seven years of leadership, the school district earned top honors, and in 2019, it was recognized as the sixth best public school district in the nation. Prior to this position, he served as the deputy superintendent in the Park Hill School District in Kansas City, Missouri where he provided direction for the district's quality program, strategic planning, K through 12 principal supervision, and leadership development. He started his career in education as a social studies teacher in Columbia Public Schools. I'm gonna hand it off to the Vice President Lynn Mignette to tell you the rest about Ms. Dr. Miles. Dr. Miles is a native Missourian and his degrees are from the University of Missouri, Columbia. Go Mizzou. Uh, this includes Doctor of Philosophy and Education Specialist degree in Educational Leadership and Policy Analysis, a Master's degree in Political Science, a Bachelor's degree in Secondary Social, Social Studies in Education. <clears throat> As a school board, we are impressed by his work history, professional career, and his advanced knowledge. But our decision to name Dr. Miles as our finalist was sealed by his heart for kids that came through loud and clear in all of our conversations. We firmly believe that Dr. Miles is the individual who will honor the success of the past and the strong foundation we have built with Dr. Kino, with Team K. Um, we are confident that he will uphold the promise to shape the future of our great school district by always keeping students at the forefront of every decision. A few things to note. Dr. Miles is sending a personal message to all the members of our Rockwood School community this evening. You'll find this information posted on the Rockwood website in just a few minutes, as well as social media. Be sure to check your email and Rockwood website this evening. Run home and do that. We will be hosting a welcome reception for Dr. Miles the week of March 25th. We'll share the invitation with our school community in the coming weeks and we would love to see everyone come out and welcome our next leader. Before we move on to the next agenda item, I wanna share on behalf of every board member that we sincerely appreciate that our school we appreciate our school community for its involvement. Laura Lee talked about that and, and that we wanna make sure we reiterate that, that we were united, we came together and what is best for our students, and we thank you all. All right, so now you can all stop bugging us, <laughs> <laughs> and we can move on. 
Early, if I could just uh, yeah. say he's not here, obviously, mm -hmm. but uh, Mark and I know of each other. We're not, um, we haven't had the opportunity to work together, uh, but we have a lot of uh, connections and a lot of the people that whose paths we've crossed. You made an excellent selection. Mark is uh, high quality. The people that I know that have worked closely with him cannot say enough good things. And uh, um, as, as a text I received from somebody I know very well said to me that uh, Rockwood will be in good hands in July 1, which makes me sleep a little easier and makes me feel good about the good work that, that we have all collectively been doing in the last five years. So congratulations on a great decision. I, I just want to uh, publicly thank this school board. I mean, I'm going to pat ourselves on the back, but we all did our research. We worked together as a team. Uh, in the end, it was a very difficult decision, but we, uh, we wholeheartedly did this for our kids of Rockwood. So, all right, moving on. 8.02 is Proclamation of Social Work Month. So I need a motion to approve that the Board of Education proclaim the month of March, and specifically the week of March 3rd through 9th, 2019, as Social Work Week in the Rockwood School District. Okay, I have a motion and a second. So Brittany Hogan, I believe, is coming forward. Hello. Good evening. Good evening. Thank you guys um, first so much for your support of our department, Dr. Knauss and the board. Um, we went from 15 social workers and then we added the SEBs with another four and with me we are at 20. And we're really excited to continue to support our students the best way we can in our buildings and thank you for taking the time to recognize our hard work. Very good, thank you. Director Romberg is going to read the proclamation. Sorry. Sorry. <laughs> Social Work, Month, uh, Social Work Month 2019 Proclamation. Whereas social school workers in the Rockwood School District and districts across the nation serve as vital members of the educational team, playing a central role in creating a positive school climate and vital partnerships between the home, school, and community to ensure student academic success. And whereas all children have the right to safe environments and quality education, and whereas dignity and compassion for all students help define a school's character, and whereas the primary mission of the social school work profession is to enhance well-being and help meet the basic needs of all students, especially the most vulnerable in our schools, and whereas social school workers help students at every grade level function better in their classroom, school, and home environments, improve their relationships with others, and solve personal and school problems, and whereas there is a growing need for school districts to address services offered by social school workers for students' emotional, physical, and environmental needs so that students may achieve academic success, and whereas social school workers are especially skilled in providing support and services to students who face challenges, including poverty, disabilities, loss of loved ones, identity, relationships, school transitioning, and other barriers to learning, and whereas social school workers celebrate the courage, hope, and strength of all students, whereas Rockwood School District is proud to recognize the importance of social work in our schools and the critical role that social school workers play in helping mold and educate all students. Now, therefore, in recognition of social school workers in the Rockwood School District, we, the Rockwood School Board of Education, proclaim the month of March 2019 as National Social Work Month and specifically the week of March 3rd through 9, through 3 through 9, 2019, Social School Work Week, and call upon all citizens to join with the National Association of Social Workers and Rockwood School District in celebration and support of the social work profession. Signed this day, this seventh day of February 2019. And the motion is to approve that social school work Social Work Week, March 3rd through 9th. All those in favor, say aye. 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 Anyone opposed? Thank you for being champions for, for our kids. kids. Thank you. Yeah. All right, next we have an Innovative Learning Center presentation with a video. Uh, and this was part of our COPE Committee's master plan here to keep us updated on things. So Dr. Dave Cobb and Bob Deneau, welcome gentlemen. I like your shirts. 
the same color name. <laughs> right? Yeah. <laughs> Did not know. That's right. I'm sorry, Dr. Cobb. You are colorblind. I forgot that. All right. You're wearing the same shirt. All right. Gentlemen, welcome. Thank you. Well, we are excited to give an update on our elementary innovation rooms. Um, as you know, years ago, it started with the process of looking at the one that we had at Pond and really taking a look at how we can duplicate that over our 18 elementary schools. And it's really come a long way from the inception of school teams taking a look at a space in their schools and having a team of teachers to go out and find what works for their schools to, to develop a space where students can be innovative and teachers can do wonderful things. And from that point, as you guys have seen our elementary schools, these rooms have really come into um, every school is unique in their own way. Um, and it's really an awesome thing to see. We, the best way we could really talk about how, how, how good they're doing is, is through a video. And, and I really enjoyed a couple weeks ago, we got to go to different schools and watch Curtis help with um, describing what it would be like when we ask children, what is it like to learn in here? And we ask teachers, what is it like to teach in here? And just listening to the excitement in their voice. You'll see that in the, in the video, but um, we want to just let you know that these spaces are just tremendous places and um, want to play the video now and then we'll be here for questions afterwards. So. The kids really understand this is a whole different kind of space. It's like they turn on a different part of their brain when they just walk through the door. And I think that's what the room was for. Once I get kids started in this space, they run it all by themselves. And it's not so much a, an expression on their face, but the way they talk about the projects that they're working on. It's not, Miss Tucker, I need your help on this. It's, whoa, look at what I made by myself or with my team. And even some of my kids who I maybe wouldn't have predicted would be able to grab a kit and figure it all out by themselves, they're doing it and they're doing it in five minutes. <laughs> I get my hands on stuff and know like what has to do with the real world instead of like having a pencil and a worksheet and doing math and um, we get to make like our learning way and put it into like an experiment or craft here. You see them get involved and work as a team and try something new and solve problems and it sparks. You can just see like a, a gleam in their eye and a smile on their face. And it's not just like doing work, but it's like, I think I could take this somewhere further in the future. This is a special environment to me because I've been doing these types of challenges in my classroom, but it's very limited. We don't have access to nearly the amount of consumable materials or the whiteboard space. Um, for the design or the tables, those kinds of things really allow us the space to be creative. This room is awesome. It's much more open. They can move around freely. They have access to all of the supplies. So for teachers especially, instead of having to um, collect all of the supplies like right beforehand, they're already here. The kids are able to access them. And so it really puts them in charge and allows them to be leaders and the teacher just to be the facilitator. I think I have an idea. Okay, so I was thinking um, we could do like, um, a boat like that. As you can see right now, they're just very engaged and they're loving what they're doing. They're motivated and they just love to be at school. As we wrap up all the innovation room projects, it's amazing to see the transformation that has occurred in student learning. Students are getting to put practical skills to use and they're practicing STEM skills at the same time. And teachers can approach learning in a whole new way. It's amazing to see the results in these rooms so far and I can't wait to see more in the future. Curtis makes us look really good, um, but you can see the focus in these rooms is on student creation, and it's also on active learning. They're, students are not passively just taking in information, and you can see the wide variety of things happening there. I think that's what's really exciting. It does offer a bunch of new opportunities, but we also know that we still have a ways to go to get everybody very comfortable in those spaces. And so. You know, we've got off to an awesome start, but we're going to keep it going forward to do even more for students and for our teachers. Can you talk a little bit about what we're doing to support teachers' professional development so that they are using the, the spaces wisely and 
maximizing the, the connection to the curriculum? And yeah, abs absolutely. So this year, one of the very first things we've done, anytime we've gone into a building, and many times once a room is open, somebody, whether it's been me or one of our um, elementary instructional technology specialists, we've gone in to work with those teachers in some capacity. Sometimes it is going in on early dismissal day. Sometimes it's actually spending an entire day working with every team. Um, we've gone in and done short presentations. And we always start with an exploration piece. Um, we kind of let the teachers be kids a little bit. Um, we had a huge workshop in here where I had a bunch of tables set up and you would have thought the place was a huge mess and a little bit of chaos, but everybody was experiencing this as a student. And I think that's where we start. Once they get comfortable with supplies, we've always said the next step is, now how do we help you make those connections? Um, one of the other things we've been doing is we've been kind of curating lessons and resources, and I've posted those all on one website that I keep, and I constantly, I'm sure people are tired of me mentioning this website all the time, but we have that there. We also have tutorials for teachers and students to know how to use everything, and that's just something that's expanding. There's always new things coming out there. I say very little of it I probably create. I try to curate from others who have really either doing great things with it, or I find, you know, the companies are putting out good resources, and so it's really multi-tiered. Um, we are trying just to meet needs wherever we can. Um, I know there are some after-school classes that teachers can take in within Rockwood to learn more about that. We've done a few things over the summer. So we're really just trying to address it from multiple fronts so we can meet teachers as learners like they are and how they want to learn. Me too. You are, there's, we're seeing an interconnectedness between all of our, our 19 elementary schools that are collaborating together through your website, right? Absolutely. Yeah. And I think it's, and it's also, I've tried to encourage people to um, post on Twitter with our RSD STEM um, mm -hmm. hashtag because that lets me see what's going on. Because a lot of times, like, I didn't know they were doing that. Now I can, now I have that little trick in my bag I can share with somebody else. So. Many of our schools, have, their teams have gone out to other schools and done site visits as well so they can actually see it in action. We now have an innovation room in every elementary school? Almost every elementary school. We Almost. have one left, right? Yeah, uh, Baldwin. Baldwin needs some more construction, so that's going to happen over um, the summer. summer. And Geggy, now that we have the addition done, um, they're approving their furniture purchase tonight, so that'll get that ball rolling, but the rest of the room is in really good shape. New Eureka Elementary will have one within its facility as well. Yeah. About to, why do you have in the middle schools and or the high schools for when they get out of elementary school? I think one of the things we're trying to do is this kind of leads into some of the coursework um, that students get into. So for example, in middle school, um, some of our, we call it the technology class, the engineering classes, this kind of feeds into those. We started a brand new um, computer science course this year. And so we're really thinking this can lead students into some of that coursework. There aren't spaces like this necessarily in any of the middle schools or in the high schools, but there's a strong STEM connection, and so we're hoping that this really, we draw students in early, and maybe a student who wouldn't have thought of pursuing this will actually maybe take a middle school course in, let's say, robotics or 3D modeling or computer science, and maybe that leads them then to take something else in high school. So that's kind of the direction we have right now. I think we're, this was truly, from a STEM perspective, we're really building strong foundations in STEM, and this just gives us an extraordinary tool to do it um, that other districts are seeing, and they want to come see what we've done. So that's really cool. I would I would add to what Bob said. Uh, you know, going back, first of all, we need to thank the community because this was part of our 2017 bond issue, and uh, I remember saying a number of times that, uh, and it's often this this way, uh, on a ballot measure, sometimes the things that cost the least are some of the most exciting things. This was a pretty small portion of, of that 2017 bond issue. Um, but interesting to Dr. Kinder's question, it, it really originated out of us trying to make sure that we were sparking that innovative interest in our elementary kids and we didn't want it to be a, a, you know, an initiative, a curriculum rollout per se, um, but we wanted to, that's why we stuck with calling them innovative spaces because they were resource uh, spaces for our teachers and Bob's expertise of helping us decide what equipment should be in those spaces and uh, his expertise even with the professional development and being a resource uh, for our teachers as well. It's just, it's, it's really, I think, it's panned out exactly as we had envisioned. Um, some, some people are more excited and quicker 
but but that that's a good thing in itself because uh, you know educational colleagues have a way of igniting other educational colleagues so it's it's kind of infectious and uh, and you can see in the video it's it's very effective even when when kids can define you know what they're doing uh, in the innovative spaces and why it's special then it's it's good stuff so appreciate your your leadership Bob on on help like this are the status of the stem labs at the high schools what was it was the question Status of the STEM labs at the high school? I still didn't hear that. I'm sorry. Yeah, STEM labs. Oh, status. I'm sorry. Labs. Well, we are uh, uh, all three high schools. Uh, the initial, well, Lafayette and, and Summit. Summit are completely done. Um, the addition at Marquette is done, but we, the next phase of going in and renovating the, uh, the existing science classrooms, converting some of them, and then, uh, of course, we are in process with the um, uh, the 90,000 square foot addition to Eureka High School, which is uh, phase one is, is going on right now. That's the site development, getting ready for the building to be erected. And uh, those bids are out on the street, I think. I think, what, which, March? Okay, so. Now, where will the STEM, STEM labs be at Eureka? Will it be in the older science section or in the new part? part? Ninety thousand. Part as okay. part of the part of the addition, the old science will be converted over to different classrooms. Different classrooms. Okay. Good. Thank, Thank you, you, gentlemen. Thank you. Thanks, guys. All right. Next, we have an assessment update, and so Director of Research Evaluation Assessment Glenn Hancock will be coming forward to give us that update. Welcome. Thanks for your time this evening. This evening, um, we'll be sharing just a, a high-level overview of our assessment results from ACT, AP, and also MAP. Uh, typically, this update comes out kind of at the same time as our reports to the community. Uh, but this year, due to delays with MAP testing results, uh, that we had to push this timeline back a little bit. So that's why it's coming to you a, a month later than it normally does in here. So uh, tonight, we'll focus on, um, again, a high-level overview of some of our results. That include AP, ACT, and our MAP scores. And uh, this is just one piece of the picture. Um, you know, you heard some great things about our anti-bullying ambassadors. You just saw a great video of our STEM labs and what's happening in our innovation rooms in our schools. So there's so many great things that sometimes isn't captured by the standardized testing in there. So um, with that, um, Bretta is going to help drive because this is all available publicly on our website. So she's going to help me drive. And we'll begin with uh, the ACT. Again, just a quick overview of our ACT and beginning with our composite average. Uh, our composite average for the ACT is around 23.9, uh, a small decrease, but still one of our highest composite averages the past five years. Uh, Rockwood has approximately just about 100% of our graduates, the time they graduate, participate in the ACT. And this is very helpful as it, with college admissions. But also ACT has started to include a career readiness indicator. Um, they call it the National Career Readiness Indicator, and it gives a few different levels from uh, bronze to platinum, and those different levels are associated with different jobs and careers. Uh, St. Louis is actually also a, um, I don't want to say a hub, but they participate in this as well, and they have different companies that align their roles with particular levels of this career readiness certificate. So not only is this a college-ready exam now, but it's also geared towards career readiness as well. And Brenda, if you scroll down, you'll see our in terms of college readiness benchmarks, uh, Rockwood maintained at students meeting four, all four of the college readiness benchmarks, so benchmarks in math, English, science, and reading. And again, those um, benchmarks qualify as a 75% chance that you'll get a C or better and a 50% chance you'll get a B or better in your entry level uh, college course in that corresponding subject area. Well, next transition uh, to MAP, and again, uh, as I kind of mentioned, MAP results were delayed this year. Uh, MAP has undergone four different assessments in five years. Um, this year, our students will take the same assessment for the second year in a row, and so this is a, really, the 2018 results are a new benchmark for us. Uh, it's really difficult to compare as they were different assessments than prior years from last year. And they also use different cut scores. So you might have seen there was an article in the Post-Dispatch regarding cut scores and regarding test results. And so it's really not 
a fair comparison to compare between the, the different years. So what it, we have up here is our 2017-18 results, and you see Rockwood compared to the state of Missouri. And that's one way we can look at our results is taking our scores against the state of Missouri to kind of look for any pattern or trend there. So this is on the screen you, you see ELA, and then below that, uh, Brennan, you'll see the percent scoring proficient or advanced on our math in here as well. If these were side by side with prior years, again, you would see a, dec a decline between the prior years because again, different assessments and different cut scores were used in here. So that's why we're not really pairing these uh, side by side here. However, social studies uh, was uh, the same exam and you can see the trend over time. Again, we are consistently above Missouri uh, in terms of percent proficient advanced. And then with science, uh, it was a field test, and so we did not receive any scores for fifth, eighth, or biology. And so it's we have zero, zero results to share. Um, next year, though, we will get our first set of results looking at uh, our science scores inside of there. If you jump over, the other area we also like to share and report on is uh, traditionally what's known as our, our achievement gap. And we do like to share is I mean, there's always areas for improvement that we have within our scores. And what we have on our screen is the total population at the top that's represented by the orange diamond. And underneath it is the yellow diamond, which is our super subgroup. Uh, students in our super subgroup are students that are African American, Hispanic, have an IEP, our ELL, our English language learners, um, or in the free reduced lunch program. And you'll see the gap that is between um, our total population and the super subgroup for English language arts that's on the screen that's approximately a difference of 26.1 per percentage points. When you scroll down, we'll see a very similar gap uh, between um, our total population for math and the super subgroup as well. And there are a lot of, a lot of things within the curriculum department uh, that we are working on, especially within math. We've uh, adopted a new elementary math program over the past two years. There's a lot of professional development that's occurring with teachers and really helping with that math mindset that it's everybody's a mathematician now and it's not just for certain people and so really helping um, really being good with numbers and number theory and number understanding and that I think you'll see a transition with a lot of a lot of our math uh, data over the next few years and the last area to highlight uh, this evening is in our advanced placements so students take uh, advanced placement testing this year we are this past year we had a slight decrease in the total number of exams that were taken, but it, we did have increased the number of students that participated in taking an AP test. Uh, so again, while it's a smaller number in total exams, we did have an increase in number of students participating. And roughly about 30, almost 31% of our st students participated in at least one AP exam um, last year. And then when you scroll down, you'll see the advanced placement students that score three or higher. So again, typically whenever you're looking at AP results, uh, three, four, and five are typically what's accepted through college. And they usually get a college level equivalent course, uh, score three or better. And again, uh, Rock was maintaining a, a strong percentage above, this, above Missouri and the nation in terms of percent getting a three or better. Any questions this evening? I have three or four. The ACT down, ACT was down this year. Do we know why? Uh, no, no particular reason. This was, uh, when you look at the composite score, it's still one of the highest we've had in the past five years. Then here. I'm sorry, what? It's still one of the highest scores we've had in the past five years. The overall composite was down, but in terms of students uh, meeting the benchmarks, we've had the same, num same percentage of students meeting all four benchmarks, and even students meeting three or more benchmarks, we stayed at 62% as well. It was the next the next slide. College and career readiness were at forty eight percent. How do we get that above seventy? How can we get that above seventy? When you look at if you scroll down the um, when you look at the forty eight percent again, that's forty eight percent are meeting all four all four benchmarks in there, and I think it's over time and continue to continue to provide great opportunities for our students like we're doing. Is it one particular benchmark that's uh, now? Of the four, science is the lowest in terms of students meeting that benchmark, the percent of students meeting that benchmark. 
And I think the increase, what we're doing, improvement with STEM, innovation, I think you'll see that supporting that category. Well, the, the achievement gap is still at 25, 26%. Now I realize that the minority groups are raising their percentage, but the majority group is raising their percentage and it's still around 26, 27%. What can we do to get that gap to zero? That's a great question and one that we continue to strive to work towards. I, again, I, I mentioned a little bit, we adopted a new English language uh, arts program. Uh, we've started doing more, um, I would say more assessment, but making sure we're able to provide the right intervention. So we're including more interventions in our reading program. Uh, and again, with math, we're continuing our professional learning development with teachers um, to provide opportunities for them to be more comfortable um, supporting uh, going a little deeper with number theory with our students. Do you know if we're not allowing minority groups in advanced classes because we don't think they can do it or do we allow anybody in that, w that wants to? Do you know how that works out? You're referring to AP, honors classes? Yeah. Overall, there are different prerequisites for each of the courses. Uh, we do have populations of minorities for reduced lunch in our courses, we can always obviously increase that diversity in them. We don't just allow anybody that wants to take an advanced course in it. it has to have s some have some prerequisites? Some courses have prerequisites in terms of the prior course or a course grade in a prior course. Okay. My last question. You said 31% of students at the high school level will take an AP test. Doesn't sound like much. But do you have a breakdown by ninth graders, 10th graders, 11th graders, and 12th graders? Because I would assume not that many ninth graders and a little more sophomores, more, more juniors, and maybe less seniors. I don't know. And, and you'd be correct with that assumption. I don't have the exact breakdown, but you would be correct in the 11th and 12th are the higher number of students participating in at least one AP exam. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Just a follow-up question to uh, Kendra's question. Um, this is our first year moving into fast bridge and, and the interventions, and we're tracking that kind of data, aren't we, is to see the students that we're moving and their progression? Correct. Okay, yeah, I thought we were. Yes, yeah, so we're looking at FAST data. Um, we're, we're using a combination of FAST data, the BAS scores and STAR, right. to kind of monitor and track and then use that as entry and exit criteria for intervention programs. But it tells through the public. Absolutely. I thought we were. Mm -hmm. and, and I would I would suggest to Dr. Kinder's question about uh, the, uh, the achievement gap those are the appropriate data sets to track and monitor and, and, and decrease that achievement gap because unfortunately what's what the state uses is map testing and um, uh, you know we can't get through a conversation like this without me commenting and in a number of months you won't have to hear this anymore from me but hopefully Mark Miles will pick it up and, and run with it as well um, as Glenn so eloquently said uh, in a different way what he really meant to say is that the, the map test has been useless for the last five years. Um, it, has, you said, it, has, uh, it has done nothing to inform instruction uh, when it comes to the achievement gap. And this is not a denial of an achievement gap. We definitely have an achievement gap, but we need to use those right data points and those right data sets to, to tackle that, and we are. But what we know about achievement gaps shown by map testing is we know that uh, there are certain student groups that do not perform as well on standardized tests as other students do. That's, that's the achievement gap, I think, associated to standardized testing. Um, so we just have to keep that perspective. But, but there really uh, is nothing we can draw from the scores of, of our map testing that, that really does anything for us to inform instruction. There's no longitudinal ability um, because they are entirely different. And, and we've been told this is, the, this is the last year now. Now we're going to have something we can compare next year. I have asked that question uh, in state level forums uh, for at least the last three years and have been told, well, next year we should be okay. And here we are again with a brand new data set with cut scores changed drastically and we don't really understand why. We still have never really received a good explanation of why those cut scores changed as they did. It's, it's kind of like telling kids we're going to go out and run the 50-yard dash and we want you to try to do it in this time. But, hey, wait, before you try that, before we get any progress with that, let's, make, let's, let's, let's raise that cut score and make you run it even faster. 
just doesn't make any sense. So anyway, just perspective to, to keep about the map data. I do want to offer one other thought, and that is that we have to keep sharing sharing results, not just state assessment data, standardized assessment data, but all of our assessment data results with students. They need to see their growth. They need to see their progress. And when we make it more meaningful to them, more meaningful to them than it is to us, I think you'll see a lot more growth quicker. And so we've been doing a lot of work with the curriculum departments, also with um, anytime we're rolling out new curriculum to start talking about the assessment and formative assessment along with that because it's important that the students understand their progress um, and being able to see that growth and set goals because that's what's going to ultimately change. That's going to be their life um, that they're going to have as a lifelong learner. So that's another strategy we'll be using along the way as well. Map score is still impounded? Are they be they've come out? No, they're out. Yeah, they're out. Do you have any feedback from parents? Uh, we have not received anything. Oh, that's a... Uh, well, I guess I'll say exciting. I don't know. I, I, to me, that shows that uh, our community understands. Our parents are are, are uh, smart in their understanding. And of course, we've been we've been keeping them informed and uh, uh, talking about these changes in, in map testing and such. So, but anyway, Dr. Kinder, we were still thought with drastic changes that. Uh, that there would be some concern, but I have fielded zero phone calls. Uh, Shelly, I don't think you've had any. So I think our parents get it. I think they understand what MAP testing is. I do want to compliment Shelly. She's done a wonderful job. I'm not sure how many years you've been here, but you've done a great trans transformational, how many years? Yep, transformational job in, in the area of curriculum. I don't know how you get all the pieces together because we see the pieces on a monthly basis with presentations, I don't know how you get it all together, but you've done a, you've done a mar marvelous job. Thanks. And I want to thank you for your work you've done with discipline data. You, you knew I was going to go there, didn't you? <laughs> and some th that would be a great presentation to bring back to the board sometime, just the system you've set up and some of the results, because we could, there's opportunities for improvement there as well. Yes. Yeah. So I think, I don't know, I, we track, not track, but we ask kids after they leave Rockwood at some point, surveys, whatever, to kind of give us feedback about, all right, this worked, this didn't work for me, suggestions. We, we do that? We do that. Right now we, we, we ask the mandatory questions according to the state in terms of where are they going, um, is it a four-year, two-year institution? And do they attend the first semester? Are they working? How many hours? And that um, we have taken a step, uh, and I believe Natalie is going to come talk about a curriculum in a second. Uh, but we did work with the um, English language arts uh, curriculum to write a survey, and we asked our former graduates about their English language arts curriculum in high school, and we received some wonderful feedback. They are uh, an absolute valuable, untapped resource that we can definitely continue to learn more from. Also, that at Maryville, we have several students that come in from Rockwood, and I think Laura Lee can attest to this, and she's teaching a class with at least three in there, I think, this year. They never say anything negative about Rockwood. They're always positive about Rockwood. And I know that the Maryville community appreciates Rockwood students as much or more than just about any other district in the area. So that's, that's a positive for Rockwood. Absolutely. You may find it hard to believe, but he did come into my class and ask each student where he went to high school, where they went to high school. <laughs> First day. I believe it. They're all like, who is that guy? <laughs> <laughs> all right. Any other, any other questions? All right. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. All right. Speaking of curriculum, we uh, need a motion to postpone approval of the elementary counseling curriculum as presented at the February 7th, 2019 board meeting. Move. And we have a motion and a second. So Shelly, you're coming up first, all right? I'm just gonna introduce these ladies really quickly and then I'm gonna turn it over to them. But okay. Our elementary counseling curriculum was rewritten um, in the last year and this is the first time, I think in a long time, that they have worked in consultation with the curriculum department. So I had the pleasure of working with this group. Um, we started putting everything on the typical curriculum um, templates and they really made a concerted effort to align what they're doing to 
the CASEL framework and to the Second Steps programs that we have in our elementary building. So we purchased that resource for teachers if they wanted to use it, but now this guidance curriculum is gonna align to that beautifully so that the counselor can kind of kick off the topic and then turn it over to the teacher to work on that class, that work in the classroom. Um, this group came to Rockwood Learning Council and presented one of the lessons for us. It was a great lesson on feelings. Um, there's a lot of really great adult or young adult and children's literature in it that teachers will be sharing with their kids and we're providing that for every building. So we're really excited to bring this forward and I'm gonna turn it over to Lynn if you would come up and show all the work that you've done. Going to introduce them? Did you do that? No, it's just there. I'll have a minute to Okay, all right. My name is Shannon Krzyzewski, and I am the school counselor at Canton. I'm Tina Kilpatrick. I'm the school counselor at Utah Valley. I'm Emily Webb, the school counselor at Wild Horse Elementary School. Um, and we also shared just the other uh, team members that we worked with throughout the process, um, some of whom couldn't be here tonight. Um, and the thing that we wanted to really highlight here was just the collaborative effort that we made to consult with many other groups within Rockwood. So from just the middle school counselors, uh, what are you doing? Where, you know, where are our kids coming in? What do you see as strengths and needs? Um, social workers and then um, our administrators, um, we were able to talk about things even um, like how um, STEM and innovation can connect with school counseling. Um, and then as well as parents and teachers. So we wanted to make sure that we had um, good feedback from everybody as we moved forward. And I just wanted to apologize too for Todd and uh, Katie, our team members not being here. Apparently 109 is closed right now, so they are stuck in traffic. So I know they wanted to be here. So. Yeah. Where's it closed yeah. at? I'm going home. <laughs> yes, I know. Um, somewhere right by, um, the, like near, by like past Alt Road uh, between here and Alt somewhere, so it's a pretty big stretch. Oh. I know. No. I know that because I slid down the road to get here. Yeah. Can you go home first and let me know how I do? <laughs> Excuse Dr. Kendall. Uh, to you guys. Okay. Right, here <laughs> we go. <laughs> <laughs> I know it's important. I wanted to let. That's why I said that because I want to let people know that. Um, Anyway, um, I was asked to share a little bit about our journey, and I say our journey because as you can see on this timeline, we started this process um, in February of 2017, almost two years ago. Um, we first met with Shelley Bullock and, uh, to receive our Rockwood curriculum training and writing training, and on a side note, I do want to say she truly helped us to not feel completely overwhelmed, um, still overwhelmed, but we knew we had support and um, how to start this major undertaking. So once we understood what was an essential question and an enduring understanding and remember what was the difference between the two, we set out for the first time ever to write our own Rockwood Elementary Counseling Curriculum. Uh, during the spring and summer of 2017, we developed a rough draft of our scope and sequence. In the fall of 2017, we were ready to share it with others, as Ms. Uh, Shannon had just shared with us about. We invited administrators, elementary and middle school counselors, social workers, parents, to get the feedback of what we needed to add, delete, change. We continued to meet as a team through the winter and summer of 2017-18 to see how we could provide, we were looking to provide uh, continuity between grade levels. You know, we were trying to provide that framework of what we wanted the students to know before they left elementary school and getting ready to go into middle school. After we finalized our scope and sequence, we then turned our attention on how to develop the learning activities to support our grade level expectations. So we decided to do this by meeting with all the, our elementary counselors again. And we asked everyone to bring and share their best must teach lesson that they really feel makes an impact for the children. We then added these as the learning support activities um, for each of our GLEs. Uh, also, uh, this school year, 2018-19, we have as a team been using our scope and sequence um, as a guideline to help us teaching our lessons right now. During this entire process, when someone shared a good resource uh, that matched our scope and sequence, we added it to an ongoing resource list. 
we started uh, sharing this list with all the elementary counselors and then we asked them which of these resources do you feel that every elementary counselor needs to be able to teach this curriculum. This past October, then we presented our curriculum to the super committee, and now we are here sharing this with you. And now Emily is going to share more about how we decided what we're going to put in our curriculum. All right, so one of the first things we did as a committee is we looked at the framework of CASEL, and Shelley mentioned CASEL. It stands for the Collaborative for Academic and Social Emotional Learning. And this is an organization that emerged about 30 years ago and looks at how to merge the academics with social emotional learning. And they looked at what traits and skills do um, incoming employees need to be successful. And what they were finding was that young working adults were coming in with the academic skills of reading and math and writing, but they were lacking some of the soft skills or life skills. And so that was the request coming from employers. How do you teach those skills to problem solve, to work together, um, and to get along on teams and some of those skills that you need? So what we did was we used this framework to build our curriculum around, and we studied these five competencies carefully. And we alluded earlier with the second step curriculum, we incorporated the same language so that the language that we are using in our monthly guidance lessons is the same that teachers are using through the second step kits. Um, we spent a lot of time on this, and even though our components, and we'll go over in a second, are divided up into three different areas, this is the one where we will spend the most time as elementary counselors. It's the one that's most important even in um, focusing for some of our young friends just with um, dealing with some of those emotional regulation pieces and those early just skills, those foundations to be successful. So we built it around this framework and it doesn't go into great depth in here, but if you visit the website, it breaks it down very nicely. So. So, you know, what do you guys need to know about what we're doing now and how is it going to look different? And the biggest uh, way that we could describe it is that uh, the state of Missouri, as well as just the American School Counseling Association, uses three um, strands or components, social, emotional, academic, and career, to guide core curriculum. And when we started to look at CASEL, we realized Man, that social emotional piece is huge. That's what they're asking. Um, that's what employers are asking for. And that's what our kids need. It's really hard to be a good learner when you don't have those foundational social emotional skills. And so instead of it being a third, a third, a third, we really took that social emotional component or um, content area and broke it up into how can I be my best self and manage myself? How can I work with other people successfully and then under responsible decision making that really falls into not only problem solving but safety as well and it's a really good match to our safety plan right now in the district. Um, we are still going to be teaching lessons in the content areas of academic and career. We're calling them something a little bit different. It's learning skills, the skills to be your best academic learner um, and then in talking to middle school counselors, um, we realized that there was some overlap with what we were doing and what they were doing. And our job really is to create that foundation for our learners. And so we decided to change the wording to career awareness, really focusing more on strengths and interests and how that helps create kind of a path to what do I want to do and be, and how do I want to serve others as I grow up? And then finally, we just wanted to um, reiterate that our core curriculum is just one part of our role as school counselors. This, uh, we feel, is a very important component because it's the most proactive. And it's also tier one. Every one of our students gets to see not gets to, we get to see them every month. That's, that's the way it should be stated. We get to see them and we get to be proactive in how we um, talk to them through curriculum. 
wire as like responsive services, which also takes up about a third of our, our recommended time, is more of that like tier two, more crisis, more individualized um, needs. So we just wanted to point that out for the, the citizen. To thank everyone for your support and we really appreciate all that you've done to support us as school counselors. Let me just say really quick before anybody asks questions, that you, you, I know that you all know this, but you need to hear it from your superintendent and it just needs to be validated publicly. You are so crucially important in the role that, that, um, that we all play as, as educators in trying to help kids thrive. But uh, I think oftentimes, even though it's not behind the scenes, but counseling work gets treated like behind the scenes because it's you know you're working with kids in your office or sometimes one-on-one -on -one, uh, not that you don't do group things in classroom as well we know that but uh, um, I hope you know you're appreciated I hope you know that you are a a huge piece to the puzzle of putting it all together and just uh, helping kids thrive and fall in love with life so thank you from me for all you do and this is great work it's it's I can hear the excitement in your voices uh, in the ownership which just makes it extra special so thank you I do have some go ahead huh? just going to say any questions yes I'm gonna ask some questions these are much for the audience anybody who would watch this about counseling as much as anything one of them I was just curious about you listed your timeline and you had every semester on there except the spring of 2018 I know during that time you did something but you didn't have it up there on the board you know why <laughs> you're like you know what and what what are we doing <laughs> okay. your we need your timeline you didn't have I think you lumped some things together apparently you guys didn't know it either spring of 2018. I think that's really part of when we were still meeting with our um, elementary counselors and just expanding on really those learning activities. That took a long time for us to go through once we had our scope and sequence and then say how are we going to deliver that. And we wanted to make sure that we were doing things with all of the counselors that were already um, all of the counselors. We didn't want to leave anybody out that what they thought was an important lesson that needed to be taught. And so it, it took a long time to coordinate all that those efforts. So thank you. It's o a great graphic, though. O over the oh years, dear. over the years, the duties and things that they put on counselors has changed, especially in the last five or six years. Well, you not only are a counselor, you're also a trauma expert, as trauma increases in all levels of schools, high school, middle, and elementary which means that's an extra burden on you. And I'm assuming that, that 30, 40% of responsive time is when you deal with trauma. Is that true? Well, I mean, you deal with it whenever it comes, but that may be that part of your time. Yes, I would say that um, in the elementary level, if there's a problem, we are one of the first people contacted along with the administrators to help whatever we can do to help in that situation. Um, it changes daily when we're working with 500 children. There's always some something kind of going on um, It does seem I agree with you that it's changing over time <coughs> You know, I've been this is my 23rd year as a school counselor and you know when I first started it was oh the school counselor You know it was kind of like you didn't want to go to the school counselor You didn't you didn't need counseling or therapy and now it's oh you need to call the school counselor like we need to get on this which is wonderful I mean we're really blessed that it's uh, becoming a proactive rather than reactive um, situation for a lot of children. Um, it's just that you're right, it does make it difficult sometimes to do everything that we're required to do. Are you getting adequate training on trauma and how to deal with trauma? We do do a lot of uh, professional learning. Um, we just did a book study on um, trauma uh, in, our, in our, our building. Yes, through important practices. Does anyone else want to share on that piece? <laughs> Let's not fight over the microphone. Um, uh, maybe <laughs> one of <the laughs> probably one of the challenges I think at elementary is that with elementary schools being smaller, we have we're more like an island in the buildings. Um, you know, in middle schools, you have departments of counselors, and you have 
social workers and therapists that are housed. So yes, I do think we probably see a lot more trauma that we deal with individually because our social workers are with us um, once a week full time. So that can sometimes <coughs> be a challenging. But we have been fortunate to have training coming in from the outside to train us in how to work with students with trauma and how to support them. People tend to think that trauma is only a major concern in urban societies, but that's not true. It's in suburban. <coughs> Maybe not quite to the degree, but it's there. Yes, and I think that's been a, a big awareness that's come from um, a lot of different realizations that trauma can come to children, not just you think of, you know, big life crisis, but just even divorce. You know, we run support groups for uh, families with changes, and to see uh, the children in the backgrounds of some of the things that these little ones are coming to school with, with, you know, parents who are addicted to drugs and lots of domestic violence and, you're, and right. you realize how how do they just sit there and say you know oh I'm, I'm learning this today when they realize you know what things are going on at home so there is a oh, lot yeah. one last question a few years ago Matt and I can remember it maybe maybe Laura Lee there was an inequity at the different schools with the number of students that the counselors had I mean it's a pretty good gap of like 150 difference has that been taken care of wish I could say yes. I think that we're trying. Um, as an elementary counselor, we're trying to be more proactive for ourselves. I think we try. Um, we tend to try to please and do everything we can, but um, we're still above for the elementary. We're 1 to 500, whereas I believe the high school is 1 to 350, and I'm not sure middle school. Um, I don't know that number offhand. 300 and something also. Okay. How many do you have? Uh, we have fi over f um, 500 and You have 500. Four. Mm -hmm. 440. How many do you have? Last I checked, 570, but I have a point two counselor, which so I have okay. a counselor with that me one day a week. So they're I also have one point two. They're fairly close when you mm -hmm. figure in the point two. Good. So we are apparently taking care of that. Two couple questions. Yeah. Would you do just clarifying system support for mm -hmm. that percent? What does that involve? Good question. System support has to do with the roles that we take on uh, school-wide. So anything that we do in regard to uh, character education within the building, a lot of that has to do with our time that we spend um, working with um, IEP teams, things like that. Sis school system school support. School systems. Okay, I, a lot sure of I was understanding what system yeah. you were well, and also, um, you know, again, at the elementary level, it's, you know, uh, a head principal, an assistant principal, a and then there's the counselor. And so while we're not administrators, we definitely are kind of that, that third leg of the team. And so we spend a lot of time working um, on school-wide initiatives with our administration. My next question is, and how is this going to roll out to the schools in terms of your emphasis with CASEL, and then what's different about the way you're going to be doing things? So the plan is um, to host um, some training and just collaborative time this summer and then also in the fall. Um, as I think Tina stated earlier, some of us are kind of piloting per se the curriculum right now and trying to align some of what we're doing um, to what we are um, going to continue to use and then uh, also looking for some of those new pieces to try out in our buildings aware of, of how you yeah. can support them well we more. are lucky you know job alike there's 20 yeah. 22 elementary counselors and so we do uh, we will have time to work together and really talk through those pieces so it'll kind of be driven by us which is really good too you're seeing like a difference I think just this past week I did my lesson um, a new lesson that we did not have previous on empathy to second grade and it was cute because when I said you know who could tell me what empathy was all these little hands go up and they're like oh we're learning about that and even the teacher when she walked in and we were reviewing she's like oh we just did that in second step so it's a good tie-in for the uh, support of what's going on in the classrooms with the second everybody steps. Everybody aware that it's all happening yes. together. Yes. It's really important and it's a great thing that you're doing so support for the schools and, and much needed. Thank you.
good support at home too. I have a five-year-old that comes home and can out-talk her 15 and 13-year-old sometimes. Oh. Some of the counseling lessons she's had with her prerogative and her opinion pieces and all the different <laughs> things she's bringing home. So we can very, all, we can all nice see way. that happen. Right. <laughs> <laughs> right. That's right. Uh, anything else? Thank you Thank very you. much. Thank you so much. Glad you came. So the motion Great. was to postpone the elementary counseling curriculum until the February, from this board meeting to the next one. All those in favor say aye. 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 Anyone opposed? That passes. All right, next, we need a motion to postpone approval of the language arts reading enrichment and advanced language arts research presentation courses curriculum as presented until the February 21st, 2018 board meeting. Moved. I have a motion and a second. So welcome back, Dr. Shelley Willock and Dr. Natalie Fowler. Well, this looks like a daunting task with all these curricula. It really is one package from Natalie. So um, it's all ninth and 10th grade language arts. Um, we've been wanting to bring this forward. This team has been working on this for two years. And we feel like we've made some really nice student-centered changes in this curriculum. So Natalie's gonna walk you through that and talk about their process and how they arrived at the decisions that they made. Thank you. Oops, do I get this first? Yeah. And I have a cold. It is only a cold. It is not <laughs> anything else other than that. But um, so like Dr. Willott said, we've been working on this curriculum. It actually started before I came in. And um, so I hit the ground running with the new job. And we're going to talk about just some of the shifts that we saw in language arts and in education over um, so we had a team of people from all four of our high schools, and um, there were lots of us. Actually, I feel like this is not the right slide. Is it the right slide? Yeah. Clearly not the right slide, but that's all right. We'll Is there a 910 slide in there, too? That is 910. Um, yeah. That one. This is the board. <laughs> but you were willing to go with it. I know, That's I was pretty like, impressive. Oh, I'll just keep going. That's fine. Um, I, I was, I'm all thrown off because I'm sitting. Like, the last time I presented, I was standing. But So our shifts that we looked at, the first one was we went from Common Core to the Missouri Learning Standards. And there wasn't a huge change um, because, honestly, in language arts, we read and we write. And, and so that doesn't change a whole lot. But we did need to make sure that we were aligning to those two things. And so that was one of the pieces that we looked at. Um, in the new Missouri Learning Standards, they look at reading literature and reading informational text and writing, and they want our students to examine those from a reader's perspective, a writer's perspective, and a researcher's perspective. Uh, perspective. Perspective. And then there's also a speaking and listening strand that has that how you're working as a collaborator or how you are presenting. So those are kind of the, the five pieces that we look at in the, in the ELA curriculum. <clears throat> Our second shift in the Missouri Learning Standards that we saw was there used to be this focus on genre writing, like it would say argumentative writing, expository or informative writing, narrative writing. Well, now they're blending those together, and they're calling it a blended writing piece. And so just kind of the way Glenn even talked about the um, – map testing and the EOC testing, that was a huge shift for our kids this year. When they got onto that EOC, they had to write a blended writing piece. And it wasn't something, our curriculum wasn't aligned to that because we were writing under the old curriculum. And so you're gonna see that shift. And ultimately, it's just good writing. When you're writing an argumentative piece, you start with an anecdote or you fold in research. And that's what it means. So it's just putting a fancy term on something that we were already doing but it was throwing some of our kids because they were like, what's blended writing? Um, and so just making sure that we are adding that in our curriculum so that our kids are familiar with those terms. The other piece is that in the Common Core, there was a language strand, and even in the old GLEs, the grade level expectations, there was a language strand, where now we're embedding that in our writing. So we expect when our kids are writing that they're gonna go back and revise, and they're gonna edit, and that they're going to fix things grammatically. So it's a little bit more embedded in every aspect of their daily work versus being taught in isolation. So another shift that we saw that we really focused in on, and you'll, we hope that you will see this in our curriculum, is this major shift in just education being a comprehensive focus. 
So we took the standards rich literacy skills of being able to read and analyze text, but then also folding in that engagement piece. We are seeing that if our kids are not engaged and they're not motivated, then they don't learn anything. And so we have to make sure that we're engaging them. And then folding in that SEL side and giving kids the confidence and helping them find out who they are as a learner so that they can do all of these things. And so when we wrote our curriculum, we kind of had these three pieces that we kind of kept coming back to. And our fourth shift, which also kind of goes into that SEL piece, is we changed the names of some of our courses. So we had a huge discussion about honors and whether or not it should be weighted. And um, what happens at the language arts level is our kids are taking language arts honors and it's not weighted. And our, our teachers are fielding numerous phone calls from parents saying, why? Why is my kid in honors social studies and it's a weighted grade and they're in honors language arts and it's not a weighted grade? And we do offer weighted grade with our ALARP course, but we didn't offer it with honors. And so we talked about, do we make it weighted? Do we not make it weighted? We went back and forth and had lots and lots of conversations about this. And we ultimately decided that it was, it was just a regular language arts course and that it wasn't going to be weighted. But if we change the name to accelerated, that maybe we could differentiate that too so that there wasn't, we weren't muddying those waters and so ideally that accelerated course is gonna offer kids the opportunity, they just love to read and write and they want to tackle more difficult text and go at a faster pace. They can go on that track, but they're still learning the same content and the same skills that we do in our grade level language arts class. We're just gonna do it at a little bit of higher level and a little bit of faster pace. So that's why we changed the name there. We looked at our, our second class that is for our striving readers. It, we called that literature and comp, uh, or literature composition. I think there was a reading strategies attached to the end of it. Again, we, we thought about those kids looking at their schedule. We wanted their schedules to look the same as every other kid. And our teachers were really adamant about the fact that we decided what our, what our common essential standards were gonna be, that every ninth grade student needs these skills. And so we wanted to make sure that that struggling readers class was still meeting those ninth grade skills and then folding in that reading enrichment that they need in order to support them not only in language arts but also in their social studies and science classes. So we changed the name of that to language arts RE or reading enrichment so that um, we know that they need that reading support but they are still getting the regular grade level skills and concepts that every other student would be getting at that at that piece so these are the four major shifts when our teachers came together they kind of these were the four enduring understandings that they said they wanted our kids to walk away with I'm not gonna read all of them to you but we want them to be informed citizens critical thinkers skilled communicators and reflective writers so you're gonna see our standards embedded in these our ALARP course which is our weighted grade added a fifth enduring understanding and that was to be a responsive citizen and so on this particular one, they're adding that additional layer because they want to um, evoke some of that action in them. So from here, these kind of pair up with each one of those enduring understandings, which I know these mean nothing to you, but they are the standards that apply and I'll show you what they mean in just a second. But um, embedded in each one of those enduring understandings are these kind of key priority standards that our teachers focused it on. I think one of my favorite things about this was this was done last year. I mean, this was done over a year ago. And there are 11 of them that we kind of highlighted out of 35 standards. So out of all of the standards in language arts, we really focused on 11 that we said, these are the ones that we want our kids to know and master before they leave. Doesn't mean we're not gonna teach the other ones, but these are the ones we're gonna focus on. So this fall, I went to a literacy summit. And while I was there, they, they started talking about these universal literacy skills that if you go to every state in the United States or any consortium, they're gonna say that these skills are what show up in every single state standard. And when they put them up on the screen, I just looked at them and it gave me this like, okay, we're headed in the right direction because our teachers did this on their own. They said, these are the skills. And when I aligned them, all the yellow ones are what our teachers also align to. So it 
at that moment I was like, all right, we are on the same page. You didn't have this as a guide. It was their professional expertise that said, this is what our kids need and to be successful. And so each one of these you will see throughout our curriculum. Um, that being said, I don't, other than questions, but I know you guys were given our curriculum and one of the things that you will see when you're looking at our, our units and our modules is that they're more theme-based. So um, it's about exploring their culture, exploring their identity, and so t tapping into those um, engagement pieces and also that social-emotional side. We also wanted to make sure that um, we aren't teaching a text, that you know, our, our kids can have a little bit more choice and our teachers have a little bit more choice, that we're gonna study identity and we can study that with lots of multiple texts, but we're not locked into everyone's going to read this book. Um, there's still that, that opportunity for PLCs to work together, but it also is opening up a lot more choice for our teachers and our students. So, any questions? Dr. Okay. Fowler. I know you have a question. <laughs> I hope you get feeling better and I hope you get home safe. That's all I've got. No I way. <laughs> <laughs> I was expecting you to have no, more questions no, for me. I'm good. He feels bad because I have a cold. I do have a question. Yes. Um, you talked about the in shift two the blended right blended, <coughs> writing, and yet you have narrative and expository writing strands. Yes. So if it's blended, why do we still have? So, so just walk me through it. That's a great question. Um, we they don't, and I I agree. Like we don't, you know teach the test, I'm not saying that, but they do take that EOC test at the end of their 10th grade year. So in our ninth grade, what we wanted um, to do is really give them a foundation. We wanted them to walk in the door, and so they're gonna start with a very strong like writing unit, and it doesn't mean they're not gonna be reading, because they're gonna be looking at mentor texts that mirror what that looks like. And so we're gonna kind of teach it in isolation with the idea that then we're gonna pull it all back together. So it's just to say, all right, here are those foundational, this is what a narrative looks like. These are the components of an argumentative. These are the components of expository. And then as they work through that and the curriculum builds, they'll start blending it. So if you notice in the 10th grade curriculum, they, their first unit is called Right Away. And so it's a quick refresher. And then they're gonna, from that moment on, they are blending. Then in some of these other ones, like you're talking about character identity and motivation, those are blended writing into that curriculum. Is that, am I understanding that correct? Yeah, so there's reading and writing throughout, okay. but that freshman year we wanted gotcha. to do kind of like a really intensive writing and then really intensive reading of digging into this is how you're gonna function as a high school student and the skills that you need in order to, because you know, kind of what Dr. Kinder was asking about, our kids going into those AP courses there isn't a prerequisite technically. I mean like for you know AP Lit and AP Lang, any, that's open to any kid. So we need to make sure that our ninth and 10th curriculum sets them up for success if they choose that path. This is ensuring all our ninth and 10th graders have a solid foundation. Yes. That's what you're saying. Mm -hmm. The ninth and 10th standards are written in a band. Yeah. So they had to actually take that band and spread it out. So that's and so you where that came from. And so you kind of spread those between the, mm -hmm. the, the two courses. Yeah, and I gotcha. didn't really explain that very well, but yes, that's no, how, I, I yeah, they write what that. You're saying. Yeah. So. You think 10th graders don't take AP classes in English, do they? Not in English, no. But um, we are we wrote our curriculum, and um, actually the textbook that we're using is the kind of the the pre AP honors okay, textbook, and it's actually it's an amazing text because it it offers scaffolding, so it has. Um, like an entry level text, it has a grade level text, and then it has an above level text so that any of our students could access this textbook and, and use it. And it, they built the text with the idea of hitting some of those subgroups that aren't normally taking AP. Mm. And so it's like, how do we get them in at that freshman level and give them some, of, some access so that they could possibly go that path whenever they're in junior and senior year? So. Good idea. Thank and we have, I'm super excited, we have the author of the book who teaches English in a classroom with the book coming to work with our teachers. Oh, good. So. Better than that. Yes. Okay, so. It's point of order question. Yes. <laughs> um, we did them out of order. In the curriculum, or in the order of the agenda, 
and our motion was for the language arts reading enrichment and advanced language that. arts research presentation. I think what we just saw a presentation on was the ninth, tenth language arts courses. So are those that the was part of it? That's part of the yeah. band. Okay, so so there's just one one, one together. section. We we we. Uh, well, I have two motions on here, so there's we can just motions. we can just uh, we'll vote on the first one then. Yeah, do both motions. Okay. Okay. okay so. Let's vote on the first one. The motion was pr to postpone the language arts reading enrichment and advanced language arts research presentation. All those in favor say aye. 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 Anyone opposed? Okay. And the second one is a motion to postpone approval of the ninth, 10th language arts courses curriculum as presented until the February 21st, 2018 board meeting. Moved. Okay, we have a motion and a second. To be clear, there are two different presentations though. They are you not going to do the other presentations? What happened was she took the presentations from the RLC, but everything's in there that you need to see in that first presentation. <laughs> because the enrichment one has more detail about the ALRP that isn't in the other presentation, which is where I had a lot of my questions that I sent to Dr. Ballard earlier. So we'll continue to have that discussion. So who do we blame this on, Natalie? No, we presented it separately at RLC, oh, okay, and I think that okay. when it was sent that they kept it separate from I RLC. When I, I think we can agree that it was Dr. Kinder's fault. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to take the favor, blame say aye. 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 <laughs> Sorry, Dr. Kinder. All right, so let's vote on the last one then, the 9th, 10th language arts courses curriculum. All of those in favor say aye. 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 Anyone opposed? All right, thank you. Thank you. Thanks so much. Feel better. <laughs> can we make it home? I wouldn't worry about that, knowing where you live. You'd probably have to go over 10 million hills. I know. Okay, good luck. All right, give me a ride. Thank you. Thank you, Natalie. All right, uh, so next we have a motion, motion to postpone approval of the pre-calculus courses curriculum as presented until the February 21st, 2018 board meeting. Moved. Okay. We have a motion and a second. So you get the B team on this one. Lisa Lingle could not be here because she had a family emergency this afternoon. Okay. And it's kind of sad because it's her last presentation, I believe, before she retires this year. But... Um, she did a little tidying up of this pre-calculus course, so it really is pretty similar to the course that we already have. Here's the biggest change in this course, and that is the fact that colleges and universities are mentioning pa math pathways. So currently we have a lot of people who believe that they have to get to that pre-calculus to get to the calculus. The colleges and universities are building a variety of math pathways for students based on what they're going to study in college. So for instance, when I went to college and was an English major, I was told I needed to get to calculus in high school. That is no longer the case. Um, so you can see that they've pulled out some specific strands of statistics and reasoning um, and mathematical reasoning and modeling for people who are in the humanities. I would have much appreciated that. Um, Pre-calculus algebra is, our, is equivalent to our algebra three. Um, that pre-calculus is there. And then the foundations of math, they're really recommending for elementary education majors to get that conceptual understanding of number sense and foundations of algebra, basic geometry, and probability that they would be teaching in elementary school. So really it's just um, a retooling and explaining to parents and students as they're doing their college and career planning that there are other options that absolutely if you're going into a STEM field, you need to do the pre-calc and the calculus. There's no doubt about that. But we're letting people who know that are in going into other fields that there are other options at this point. So that's gonna be the biggest message with this new curriculum. Calculus no longer gonna be offered? Oh, absolutely. It's not on there. Correct, but this is pre-calculus, they would go to that next. But we're telling kids that if you're gonna oh. go into these fields, Understood. you don't need to go to the calculus. If Colleges you are telling you that kids don't need calculus to get in there. Yeah, they're trying to tool it more to careers. So if you really think about it, that statistics and reasoning is really appropriate for a lot of the fields that kids go into that aren't STEM related necessarily. And that seems to be the biggest um, draw. And then the other classes are for other content areas. So it's, it's just, I think, personalizing that math pathway to be more aligned with what they're gonna study in college. It's amazing because when I went to college, nobody had calculus before they went to college. They didn't right. offer it in high school. Right. I think that foundation for math is gonna be a real benefit to those students who are going into career edu educational careers. Calculus is not going to cut it for them. <laughs> Absolutely. 
they take two courses. Pre some could take two courses, pre-calculus algebra and then pre-calculus, or just one or the other. Um, you mean that pre-calculus algebra? That's equivalent to algebra three, so that's what we would call it. The colleges and universities are calling it that. It's like it, they consider it pre-calculus with a slant to algebra. We call it algebra three. It's usually taken in what grade level? Uh, junior, senior year, depending on where the student is in the math oh, track. Interesting. Okay. Any other questions about that? Oh, but I think so that makes great sense. Yeah. And I'm a math person, but I think that makes great sense. I think it'll be exciting news to some of our families. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So. The biggest thing you said tonight was Lisa Lingle's retiring. Did you say that? She is. We didn't know that. Did you? I have a comment about the, about the math program and the calculus mm -hmm. program in general. Uh, personally, through two sons who went through the program here and then both went to Rolla, one of the things they do at, at uh, Missouri S&T is that they, they bring you down for a day for curriculum, and the first thing to do is give you a math test. And, and uh, I would like to say that both of my sons got a four on the calculus AP exam. Both of them went through their exam, and both of them were told you need to go back into remedial math. Tell your students you've got a solid background, and if you push the school on that, they will put you in the appropriate class, but their default is always to put you back in an algebra course. So and, and I don't know whether that's because you know, the cynical side of me would say because they'll spend money on another class. <laughs> I, I think that, that a lack of math skills is, is a deterrent in an engineering field, of course, mm -hmm. but, but, but to have faith in the program here in Rockwood is really very good, and don't let them tell you you're not prepared when you really are. The trouble is you don't have that AP score when you get there, when you take that test. And so, so they'll, they'll push you back into to, uh, a lower level of class when they really don't need to. Have, have faith in the program in Rockwood. It is outstanding. And I would agree, and one of the things that we're talking about is for our students who go to a community college or a four-year university that uses that AccuPlacer, sometimes our kids don't test into that credit math level with a, with a credited course. We are thinking about developing some coursework here that would prepare kids better for that AccuPlacer so that doesn't happen when they get there. To teach for a test that you might have to. Yeah, yeah. In, some, in some of those cases, yes. AccuPlacer is harder than the ACT. Yeah, okay. it is in some cases. What would be the path for an average kid that comes in ninth grade and takes algebra? If you take ninth grade algebra, you can make it all the way to pre-calculus. Because you would take geometry, algebra two, and then pre-calc. Year, mm -hmm. you think algebra two is one year and algebra and geometry is one year? Mm -hmm. Oh, okay. Okay, any other questions? All right, so the motion is to postpone the approval of pre-calculus courses curriculum until the February 21st board meeting. All those in favor, say aye. Aye. Anyone opposed? All right, that passes. All right, so we have a couple bond issue purchases. Uh, so I need a motion to approve the bond issue purchases and related contracts, $7,500 to $150,000 as submitted. Moved. Motion and a second. So we have Deb Ketring and we have Bob Deneau. Who's up first? Looks like me. Technology, Technology, yes. Okay, so this purchase is for Gray Bar Electric, and it will be used to purchase only the supplies for construction of the um, STEM edition for Eureka High School. It will include wiring, data cabling, uh, racks for closets, um, things like that. So um, the reason it's coming through technology is that um, when we were reevaluating our Category 2 E-rate budget availability, we still had funds that we could spend at Eureka High School and could apply for this to be reimbursed. We don't have an approval yet, but we expect it will be approved, and it'll mean up to about a 40% discount of the price that's up there. So significant savings. This is only for materials, right? Yes, materials only. There are other bids. I can't see them. Were there other bids? Yes, there were. Can um, we see those? In there. And um, who got one's close in it? So um, Westco is not a local company, and Annexter um, didn't bid all of the um, appropriate items. They weren't even considered, were they? It's only twenty dollars off the other bids, so it's yes. Yeah. So. Oh, okay. So, and they were incomplete, so that makes sense. Yeah, the, and with it being incomplete, they would have been over. Okay. So that one? All right, Bob? All right, 
So uh, mine is just for um, innovation room furniture for Geggy Elementary. Now that that room is available, um, we worked with um, Geggy to make their furniture selections, and this will cover all their seating, tables, and storage needs for their innovation room. It's in line with what we. Yes. Okay. They're all generally the same. Depends on the building. The size. And yes. Mm -hmm. yeah. Absolutely. But within reason. Yep. All right, anything else about those two? All right, so the motion is to approve the bond issue purchases. All those in favor, say aye. Aye. Anyone opposed? All right, that passes. Thank you. All right, we're towards the end here. Proposed agenda for the February 21st, 2019 Board of Education meeting. And if I'm not mistaken, is that a board awards night? It is. And where is the meeting? Eureka. Pardon Eure me? Eureka High yes. School. Eureka, okay, and who are the presenters? Matt and Lynn, but no one has presented this year, so if anybody wants to change that around, <laughs> this is the first one this year. Yeah, that so makes, makes sense to me. <laughs> <laughs> All right, anything else on that agenda? Everybody have a chance to look at it, of course. Max, did you have a question? Did Keith have a question? I had written down it was Jamie and I, but I'm, I wanted Matt to do it since it's his last act. Yeah, right. so that's why I put him on there, because well, you, I Jamie? believe you two no. were... <laughs> Jamie's last act. Well, November's got canceled for weather, and that's why we. Oh, are that's off. right. That's right. We haven't had an awards night this All right. year yet. It makes sense, Lynn and Matt. Mm -hmm. I will give up presentation to you guys once we leave. All right, Lynn and Matt. All right. Future agenda presentations of events to attend. So we're supposed to check our Google Calendar for upcoming events. Anything else along those lines? Okay. So let's adjourn the meeting.